welcome back to the formal review. Today, we'll be having a very special episode. Now sit back, maybe grab a drink, and let's talk about this movie. What's up, everyone? I have shed innocent blood. Welcome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, sorry about that. We all go a little mad sometimes. Welcome back to the former review. This is season four, episode 17, and I thank you all for tuning in once again. Now, happy October, everyone. We have reached the first full month of fall. Makes me want to buy school supplies. I would send you a bouquet of newly sharpened pencils if I knew your name and address. So with October, obviously, comes Halloween. Can you dig it? <laughs> so with that, what I'm going to be doing over the course of this next month is be looking at back at Halloween slash horror movies. Now, these movies were chosen by all my followers. You voted, and these are the films that you chose. And I thank you very much for casting your vote. I'm your number one fan. Now, in this series, some of these I have seen before and some that I haven't. Now, the last analysis was on the 1968 classic Rosemary's Baby. But this one is going to be on the 2019 film and potential classic Midsummer: The Director's Cut. And I have not seen this cut of the film before, so stay tuned. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? When I was trying to get this podcast off the ground, I had a lot of questions like, how do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps that people like to listen on? How do I make money from my podcast? The answer to every single one of those questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing my podcast. And best of all, it's absolutely 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now Anchor can match you with some great sponsors. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So if you've always wanted to start a podcast and make money doing it, go to anchor.fm forward slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters all already using Anchor. Again, that's anchor.fm forward slash start. And I can't wait to hear your podcast. Now, before I get into anything, I do want to say that there's a slight spoiler warning here for this analysis. I will be going into a lot of depth here at the latter part of this episode. Now, the first part of it will be spoiler free. I will let you know when I start talking spoilers so that you can stop listening if you choose to. But if you don't care about that, keep listening. Also, I know I talk about this at the end, but the data shows that most people don't listen to that part. So I want to talk about it here and reiterate the importance of leaving reviews on your favorite subscription services. I do read those because I do want to grow because these episodes are really for all you listeners out there and I want to keep this entertaining. So what do you want to hear? Do you want to hear games? Do you want to hear more of the 4K stuff? Do you want to hear me talk about a certain movie? If you want to come on and talk to me about something for you want to debate, I'm always open to do stuff like that. So you can always reach out to me on social media. I always want to grow and improve and just because something works doesn't mean that it cannot be improved. So if there's something that you want me to improve on let me know and i will grow as such anyway so midsummer is a folk horror film written and directed by ari aster and ours florence pew jack rayner william jackson harper philham bolgren and will poulter follows this group of friends who go to sweden for a festival that occurs once every 90 years and then they find themselves in the clutches of a pagan cult so i did see the theatrical cut of this film in theaters two years ago i thought it was creepy then now i didn't think it was was as good as Hereditary, but I really, really liked it. Now, this viewing was for the director's cut, which is 22 minutes longer, and I'll go more into that in the spoiler section. Now, this version was not included in the normal release or anything like that. You had to get a special version from A24. Now, it comes in this cloth-bound Harga yellow slipcase, which is accompanied by the 62-page booklet, which has some of the artwork from the film, and also a foreword by Martin Scorsese. Now I want to read this forward to you because it immensely shows how honestly respected this film is by the amazing director. 
and quote, I like watching older movies I've never seen. I like revisiting the ones I have seen. I like watching new movies, and I love discovering the work of filmmakers that aren't known to me, particular young filmmakers that are just starting out. What am I looking for? I'm looking for people with a need to express something. I need you to experience this. Not this idea or a theme as much as a whole experience or a recollection or a profound emotional impression from which the ideas and themes emerge organically, so to speak. It's difficult to put into words for a reason because it can be expressed in moving images and sounds. In other words, cinema. A couple of years ago, I watched a first film called Hereditary by a director named Ari Aster. Right from the start, I was impressed. He was a young filmmaker that obviously knew cinema. The formal control, the precision of the framing, and the movement within the frame. The pacing of the action, the sound, it was all there, immediately evident. But as the picture went on, it started to affect me in different ways. It became disturbing to a point of being uncomfortably so, particularly during the remarkable family dinner scene after the sister had been killed. Like all memorable films, it tunnels deep into something unnameable and unspeakable, and the violence is as emotional as it is physical. Obviously, I was looking forward to Midsummer, which sounded like it was going to be made on a more ambitious scale, shot in a foreign country, bigger cash, slightly bigger budget. Sometimes in particular cases, I can remember a relatively successful first picture has led to a more expensive but less impressive second feature. More money, sometimes means the possibility of more interference and anxiety and eagerness to please, making the picture less concentrated and more diffuse. So I started watching Midsummer. And very early on, I knew that this was not going to be the case. I don't want to give away anything about this picture because you need to discover it for yourself. I can tell that the formal control is just as impressive as that of Hereditary, maybe more so, and that it digs into emotions that are just as real and deeply uncomfortable as the ones shared between the characters in the earlier picture. I can also tell you that there are true visions in this picture, particularly in the final stretch that you are not likely to forget. I certainly haven't. End quote. Now that really shows honestly how this film is looked at and how good this film is. So honestly, to go into much more will be definitely spoilers. So in short, the acting, the direction, cinematography, and attention to detail are all off the charts. This film ha is about horrific aspects of a breakup, loss, depression, obviously taken to an extreme level. It shows some fears that have no cure or solution and are things a lot of people have gone through. Florence Pugh is fantastic here and honestly, the rest of the supporting cast is very good as well. Harga as a community are very interesting as they have these movements that correspond with their emotions. But at the end of the day, Pew steals a show and a performance will honestly make the audience feel sorry for her and see why she is struggling. She's lost a lot, she's hurt, and she honestly will make your heart break. So one of the flaws that I said when I first saw this film was how similar it is to The Wicker Man. And it's kind of hard to tell if the film is supposed to be a almost direct homage or just lazy writing. And in that aspect, it somewhat lacks originality, even though there are a lot of original ideas. Also, originally, I said that some of the characters are only in the story and the audience doesn't get very much of their life outside of the story. However, on this rewatch, that wasn't really an issue and there's plenty of development to keep one interested. I also said that there were a few scenes that do drag at times. While this is true, the overall unsettling environment of the film keeps these scenes going forward. Overall, though, this film was a great time, even on this rewatch. It's creepy, horrific. It doesn't rely on jump scares and rather it's themes and aesthetic to creep you out. He has this message and theme that's beautifully written into the film, even though there are that somewhat issues with originality in comparison to The Wicker Man. Having said that, that is such a nitpick. Either way though, this film is still very, very good. The score is absolutely beautiful and the attention to detail is pretty amazing. So that's the spoiler free section. I'm gonna progress now with a full analysis with this director's cut. So you've been warned, don't progress any further if you don't wanna hear the full analysis. So when it was originally released, Midsummer grossed $27.5 million in the United States and Canada and $20.4 million in other territories for a worldwide total of $47.9 million. And the original theatrical cut has an approval rating of 83% based on 398 reviews with an average rating of 7.6 out of 10. And the site's critics consensus reads, quote, ambitious, impressively crafted, and above all unsettling, Midsummer further proved 
with writer director Ari Aster is an adult auteur to be reckoned with. End quote. And based on over 5,000 verified audience reviews, this film has a 63% rating and a 3.4 out of 5. So it's very, very, very close to being exactly the same. On Metacritic, the film has a weighted average score of 72 out of 100 based on 54 critics, indicating, quote, generally favorable reviews, end quote. And then it has a weighted average of 6.4 out of 10 based on 632 audience reviews. Now, the director's cut was rated slightly higher, but take it with a small grain of salt. On Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 100% rating based on five reviews with an average rating of 8.4 out of 10. Based on over 100 verified audience reviews, it has a 74% and a 3.6 out of five rating. So similarly to the theatrical, it's very similar. But what this shows is that there's a definite improvement between the theatrical cut and the director's cut. Now, the reason why this film was cut down was because A24, the distributor on the film, asked him to trim it down for a wide theatrical release. But on August 20th, 2019, he gave a premiere at Film Society of Lincoln Center, New York City. And then it was shown in the United States for one weekend the following week. And then it was released on Apple TV as an exclusive and then was released on multiple dates on for physical media. However, the director's cut of the film has only been released as an A24 exclusive and in very limited copies. But supposedly it's better, so we'll see. So with this director's cut, again, Aster mixes in 22 minutes of the extended scenes and subplots that don't really change the meaning of the film, but do highlight characters, motivations, and relationships much more deeply. So when he first premiered this version, he said that this was, quote, the more complete version of the film, end quote, and said that the, quote, theatrical cut may have had better pacing, but this is the fuller picture, end quote. And in short, it's not radically a different movie. It's a richer one. And as with all director's cuts, some of the moments that are added in aren't as vital as others, but really all of them keep the audience more engrossed through its almost three hour runtime. And Astor said before that same screening that, quote, if a movie is good, I want to stay in it. And this film does precisely this. You can't look away from this film. The story is developed so well that the only time that you honestly may look away is during like the really creepy moments that maybe make you even more so uncomfortable that you have to close your eyes but then in like a few more minutes you'll reopen it because you want to see what happens next it's like squishing a spider under a book it's gonna be really gross but i have to look and make sure that it's really dead now this film starts off with a very tragic event of danny played by pew losing her entire family and additionally, she's going through this rough patch with her boyfriend, Christian, played by Rainer. Christian wants to break up with her, but the timing of this family tragedy prevents him from doing so. And as such, he feels trapped and but Danny is still able to see that he wants to end things, but she's so dependent on him because of her huge loss that she's willing to sacrifice her needs and wants for him in order not to be alone. The first edition in this new cut is early on in the film with dialogue being added before the part where Diane goes to the boy's apartment. In the theatrical version, the audience learns that Danny's coming on the Sweden trip when Christian tells his friends initially. But in this cut, the audience sees him accidentally invite him to come on the trip. And then he tries to play this off as he's as it was his quote-unquote plan all along and that Danny ruined her supplies. And this really establishes how much of a douchebag Christian is. He clearly thought of this on the fly and then turned the blame around on Danny. And it's constantly throughout the film, starting from an earlier scene when she is talking about her sister to the scene and then through the rest of the film, he's constantly blaming her for things. And this specific time is after she lost her sister and her parents tragically. How dare she feel sad or mad that her partner would leave her for a trip? Yes, this is a trip that was planned ahead of time and this is an unforeseen thing that came up, but this seems one of those circumstances where plans could change. However, even if not, you didn't really know of the plans so she's rightfully upset given everything and then he blames her and shames her for feeling this way and this is also coming from a guy who 
wants to dump her in the long run. Now, this sets the stage for their relationship and what type of obviously problematic relationship it is. In the theatrical cut, there is this gradual tension over the course of the film, which then obviously culminates with the climactic scene. But in the director's cut, there's this new fight between the two where they start yelling everything out loud that they've kept inside. So this scene takes place after the Astupa ritual in a fairly uncharacteristic nighttime scene and more on that in a second. But in this scene, two of the Harga men take a tree and toss it into the lake as an offering. Then a young boy steps forward and offers himself, but just as about about to heave him into the water, Danny cries out for them to stop, only to be joined by the rest of the people in the village and then the ritual ends without death. Now, this event only ends up being a production that helps the children be okay with their eventual willing sacrifice when they come of age. Now, the reason why I brought up that this is one of the only moments of darkness in a film is because the rest of the film in Sweden is during the daylight. With this scene being at nighttime, it shows how it is essentially a farce, which aligns with the earlier parts of the film that shows Danny and Christian's relationship. It's a farce and it needs to be shown as much. And this scene adds significance to what Connie at the end of the movie is wearing when her body is wheeled off into the funeral par. Now in the theatrical cut, there's no real indication of her death, but the director's cut shows this. Now, as they're leaving this gathering, Danny and Christian start to fight about staying with the Harga. Danny wants to leave because she obviously feels that it's messed up, but Christian, who is this anthropology grad student, wants to stay and study them. Now, this is opposite to how they want to treat their relationship. In the relationship, Danny wants to stay for her dependency issues, and Christian wants to leave because their relationship is messed up. As they continue to fight, Danny starts to dissect their relationship, which shocks Christian, so then he tries to make her feel bad that she picked flowers for him. He essentially only views their relationship as this quid pro quo, where they aren't really supporting each other, but rather anytime one of them does something nice for the other, it's a mark against the other person. The reason why this added scene makes the film better is that it shows how the couple naturally recognizes the toxicity of their relationship instead of the audience simply inferring it. And this natural progression isn't forced into the story to handhold the audience, it's done in a very natural way. However, even even if one doesn't need this demonstration, this added scene also adds feeling and pain later on when Danny thinks that Christian would abandon her in the same way that Simon did Connie, allegedly. And to be honest, this is the one added scene that is the meatiest of the additions. A lot of the other additions that I haven't mentioned just add more to the community and the scenes that were shown in the theatrical cut. For example, there's more meat to showing how Christian is a lazy leech. The fight between him and Josh actually starts during the car ride through Sweden and then there's a gradual competition for information while they're in the community so the final fight between them in the sleeping quarters feels more deserved and there's also more depth given to the Harga rituals that further complicate the ending now grief is something that will hit everyone at some point in their life and this film shows that no one really should have to deal with that alone it shows how a support network is needed and these networks can help us deal with things that if we dealt with alone Alone would hurt us a lot more. And this is demonstrated with Danny's story. Now, when the smoke clears at the end of the film, Danny comes out on top and is happy and smiles. She has the support around her, but she has now tied herself to this cult, which is tragic in a way, and I'll get more into that in a second. But another theme that I noticed on this rewatch was the film's treatments of its characters of color. Now, in horror films, one of the biggest tropes is that the people of color are the first ones killed. In this story, the first ones are the main character's family. Now, there is this online theory that Pele actually killed them to instigate the events of the film. Though interesting, it doesn't really tie into the rest of the film's themes and what it's trying to say. Anyway, the first characters killed in Sweden though are Simon and Connie who are people of color. Now why is this? The film shows that outsiders are brought to the Harga for purposes of mating and or sacrificing. Now Astor said in an interview with the Daily News that this was a callback to quote a part of Swedish history and Europe. European history, end quote, that is explicitly racist. Now, one line 
line of dialogue stood out in the scene right before the climactic Maypole dance competition. Now, this competition is explained in a way to spite, quote, the black one, end quote, who sometime in the past put this spell on women and is caused to dance them in a frenzy until they died. Now, it is possible, obviously, that the black one is an allusion to a devil or a demon. It does sound a little off, given the skin tones of the entire commune. And this goes into the idea some European traditions aren't exactly the best, especially when it deals with people of color. One of the more famous and current issues is dealing with the Dutch character of Zwarte Piet, which is Dutch for Black Piet, who is the companion of Sinterklaas in, in their folklore. And the earliest illustration of this character actually comes from an 1850 book by Amsterdam school teacher Jan Schekerman, in which he was depicted as a black moor from Spain. Now, according to the folklore, the skin is this color because he went down chimneys and giving gifts to presents, and this is soot. Now, those portraying them usually put on blackface in addition to curly wigs and also red lipstick. Now, this is where the problem becomes because it comes from also Nordic ideas, and, and really this visually doesn't look right. Now, this is part of tradition, and acknowledging that this is a problem is different than removing it completely. Acknowledging and growing and slightly adjusting to time. Now, I'm not saying this is something that has to be completely eliminated like they did with this character on The Office. It's more of adjusting and learning and understanding why people have an issue with this character and maybe not doing blackface for this character or just call him Pete. He doesn't have to be Black Pete or something in that aspect. It doesn't have to be something that is controversial. With The Office, I will say that Santa Claus can have an assistant. Does he have to be called Black Pete? No. All right. Anyway, the reason I'm bringing this up is that because this is something that obviously happens in real life and it's not purposefully done to be bad, but it is a problematic aspect. So similarly to the black one being an allusion to a devil or a demon isn't great when the entire commune is white skin tone. Now again, could acknowledge it as a devil or a demon or change the name to something different. It's one of those things that again, not originally was trying to be harmful, but now it could be. So clearly there's some issues here and I'll go into more discussion on that in a little bit, but even though they may not be adamantly racist Josh when he's wrongfully blamed by Christian as the one who stole their sacred text to take pictures, the elders are more than happy to accept this, even though they're the ones who killed him. They're more than happy to allow that to be a thing. Now, one could say that all of this is conjecture. However, if one understands the history behind the Harga language and the markings around their village, it hits differently. Their language and imagery all come from Nordic runes. And if one does research into hate groups in both Europe and North America, Nordic symbols are used for white power activists. There is even a line of dialogue that Pele says about one of Josh's books because Josh has a copy of the secret Nazi language of the Uthar. Now, Uthar is is a theory that Scandinavian runes aren't a script, but a code with these hitting meanings. Now, what's interesting about this is that the Nazis themselves had a runic obsession and the events of the film take place every 90 years. Now, why is that significant? Now, it seems fair to say that the film is set in 2019 when it was released. So if you go back 90 years from that point, what was happening around 1929, the Nazi party was starting to gain its footing prior to World War II. Now, the film doesn't fully state outright that the Harga are white nationalists, but there are little clues, for example, with Josh writing his thesis. Now, Pele knows that the primary reason for the trip is for Josh's thesis, but for some reason, when Christian starts bringing his up, he prioritizes Christian's wants over Josh's. Now, and that's just one example. In the cult, you can't even have a baby without permission as they want to have a say on the genetics, which was shared by, once again, the Nazis. And Aster in this film is not trying to say that the white man is bad or to show that Swedes are anti black and immigrant haters. In fact, the cult's way of life is just simply that. They are taught that every part of their culture is normal. They show these cult members who even volunteer themselves for sacrificial means having visual distress when they're about to die, but they see the some greater good for their community. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. Shut it! And all in all, this plot is seemingly simple as a breakup story where our heroine, Danny, loses is their family.
family and then finds a new one in the cult. She is a stronger woman for it, but at what cost? She has now joined this allegedly racist cult. She has found solace in them and will theoretically start to believe their teachings. Unfortunately, this is a case with a lot of people who join groups like this. These hate groups target young, emotional, and or vulnerable people and teach them this hatred. And this is one of the biggest ironies of the film as the film allows audiences to understand and even somewhat sympathize with the cult's point of view. Danny's isolation and vulnerability is what the cult is exploiting and as such, the audience believe that Danny can be better even though she's among ideas of racial purity, strict Puritan gender roles, and mandated suicide. And this idea can be expanded onto what society does as a whole. We join groups whether it be for support or something else. Even film fandom is a society in a way and then you add in intense fan groups such as the Restore the Snyder Cut movement. Though well intended, there is some misguidedness in that group. And what I mean to say that there is toxicity when it, you cannot deny that. Again, even within this fan group, I do believe that the director's cut should be released and thankfully it was. Having said that, at this point in everything, there's a lot of financial aspects to this whole Warner Brothers thing that I'm not gonna really fight for because frankly, I don't believe I can actually do anything as a simple fan. And frankly, just because it's not a director that I may like or even I may like somebody else's more than, that doesn't mean that somebody else doesn't deserve it. It's not a one train pony. I'm sorry. Yes, very sad. Anyway, going back to this film, and again, this is the tragedy of the ending of this film because it's just as tragic as Rosemary's story as I talked about in the last episode in the series. And that's what true horror is. It's not the creepiness of the cult, but rather the tragedy that comes from it. Obviously, all these people dying sucks, and obviously, and it's good that Danny gets to be who she wants to be. But then again, is she going to be happy in this cult? Similar to Polanski's film, the audience ultimately is sympathetic to the film's main character throughout the entire story and again at the end, even though you want to feel happy for her. And this is a reaction that the horror genre doesn't give often. Another really interesting idea that I noticed on this rewatch was the concepts of bad drug trips in a way. Because there's a lot of moments in the film where arguably a lot of the characters are having bad drug trips and then phonetically speaking when somebody's saying when they have a bad interaction with a hallucinogenic drug they say you have a bad trip which speaks to the overall bad trip that they're on to sweet i just thought that was kind of this cool aspect that really showed the embedded themes of what ari aster was trying to say for example when some of the scenes that show maybe a little wind blowing, the way he displays it is almost like you're on a hallucinogenic drug and you kind of see the trees move, but if you look closer, it's not. It's more of like they're wobbling back and forth, not so much a wind blowing through the trees. And then there's a lot of just details embedded in the artwork and how that foreshadows a lot of what's gonna happen throughout the film, the seasons, and just the imagery is able to foreshadow so much of the film that even knowing this, you really see aspects of the story being told multiple times in front of you which then speaks to the idea of this is a type of story that happens over and over again it's nothing new but yet we look at it and it's still engaging it's still creepy it's just a really really interesting way to look at how creepy this movie is the most frightening thing about this situation is that the people and the environment and the events of the film could be completely normal. And that is the genre of horror realism. Now, for those who don't know what that is, essentially horror films can be put into either fantastic or realistic categories. The former is created
creating new fears in an audience such as boogeyman or monsters. The latter deals with the fears that we have about ourselves and the world that we actually live in. It takes something that we take for granted and then takes that away. Now, unfortunately, a lot of current so-called horror films fall into the former category of fantasy. They rely on jump scares and very violent imagery rather than focusing on the story. Now, realistic horror films have somewhat taken a backseat, though have started to come back a little bit with as his hereditary, Get Out, Us, Candyman, and obviously this film. In the 1970s, films like The Exorcist, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and The Omen were able to bridge the gap between horror fantasy and horror realism, and this film does that as well. It takes the scary aspects of the fantasy horror and then combines them with this grounded story that in the current world that we live in, which as I said before, makes the horror even more horrific. And this film is just an addition to that genre. It has this slow build and each moment builds on the last that keeps even the close to three hour runtime absolutely thrilling to watch. As shown earlier this year with Justice League, director's cuts are usually the best versions of a film as they show the true vision of the director. Each new minute in this film is fantastic and the film never felt longer than it did when I first saw it. The only and again outside of what I talked about at the theatrical cut the only one but only slightly problematic addition is the one that has to do with Simon and Connie the British tourists in the theatrical cut they're so horrified by the, the stupa ritual and they immediately immediately try to leave in this cut they quote unquote leave the next day but there's no really real reason for them to stay longer especially with how much they were freaking out though the argument could be made that they were convinced based on the elders explanation but that is i think a little bit of a reach but it's such a slight writing problem that really doesn't take away from the film very much because those are side characters that don't really add much to the overall scheme of the film. Now, even so, the cuts that they had to make for the theatrical release weren't awful cuts. And that version is still a phenomenal film, but this one is slightly better. And it makes sense that certain things were cut because of how they relied on the other moments, such as the dark scene that they had to cut out and then the fight. It didn't make sense to have the fight and not that first scene and if you have the first scene you might as well have the fight it doesn't really make sense to keep both or take away one or the other because they rely on each other you have to keep both of them and that's why when they're added back in it makes this film a much better and deeper story that frankly shows how this film is a masterpiece in this director's cut now, what did you think of this film? Now, do you plan on seeing the director's cut? Or if you have, what did you think in comparison to the theatrical cut? Or frankly, just what did you think of the theatrical cut? Let me know. Hit me up on social media. The formal review is on Facebook, Twitter, and the gram, and also YouTube. The handle's all the same. It's at the formal review. And for anyone who has supported me on a financial basis, I thank you very much for supporting me in that way. For anyone who wants to support, you can go to anchor.fm forward slash the formal review and click support this podcast and any donation is appreciated thank you all again for tuning in and until next time wash your hands get vaccinated or if not wear a mask and i'll see you at the movies thanks for tuning in to another episode of the former review cheers and we'll see you next time Happy October, everyone. We have reached the first full month of fall. With October, obviously, comes Halloween. Can you dig it? <laughs> so with that, what I'm going to be doing over the course of this next month is be looking back at Halloween slash horror movies. The first analysis is going to be on one of my favorite horror films of all time. The 1968 horror classic, Rosemary's Baby. Happy October, everyone. We have reached the first full month of fall. With October, obviously, comes Halloween. Can you dig it? <laughs> so with that, what I'm going to be doing over the course of this next month is be looking back at Halloween slash horror movies. This one is going to be on the 2019 film and potential classic Midsummer: The Director's Cut. And I have not seen this cut of the film before. <laughs>